So I guess that if there is one thing I've learned from blogging is that there is always somebody smarter in the room with better questions. Um, start thinking, do you have anything? Is there anybody with, uh, who wants to, can we have a microphone here? Yeah, but we, know we need to record it because uh, for posterity. Um, you all talk about the impact on communities, so kind of a social perspective, which is okay. Uh, my question at the time is, how can we apply those kind of model into organization, inside a uh, network organization or companies that try to modify their organizational model to fit the kind of situation the, the network is, is put in them. So um, how do you cope with having groups that not just organize themselves, but interact with other groups in terms of responsibilities, in terms of shared vision, and so on and so on. So to me, it's clear what you said in terms of uh, society. I kind of have a hard time. It's on, it's on make it in so. into my organization, for instance. And I think that the nice thing is the human systems tend to be fractal. So they're self-similar at different levels. The same things work, but they work fractally. I think there's two things which are important here. One is the question of starting to manage identities, not individuals. Yeah, I mean, there's a big divide in political philosophy between social atomism and communitarianism. So in social atomism, all societies in the aggregation of individual interest. That's Northern Europe, North America. Yeah. Communitarianism is each individual is defined by their social interactions. That's Southern Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Celtic fringe of Northern Europe, right? The neuroscience is now backing up communitarianism. Yeah, we're, 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 you know, nature may deal the cards, but nurture plays them. Yeah? The second lesson from complexity is managing interactions is more important than managing people. Yeah? So you manage interactions. Right? Now there's various ways we can do that. We're doing it with teams, for example, by giving them 360 narrative feedback on a real-time basis. So they can say more like this, fewer like that. We're doing the same with leaders. Yeah? We're also using crews where people are trained in role and role expectation, which means you can assemble teams without people having to know each other before. Yeah? And there's all sorts of methods around that on governance. So there's many things you can do, but the key thing is to get away from the concept of the individual is the primary unit. It isn't. It's the way people interact which matters, not what they are. Yeah? And also this concept of fractal organization, the ability to assemble different groups in different combinations for different purposes. But for that, you need a real-time feedback loop. Other thoughts? It's on. Okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Me. Um, maybe as, a, as an example, what, what, what I see happening in the Netherlands around, let's say, sort of the, the, the classical uh, citizen representation bodies that lobby government to, to improve all kinds of regulations is that they realize that they're actually too big themselves to, to, and, and too stable to themselves to fully respond to all the changes around them. And I see some of them actually collect little other organizations, groups that are more you know, uh, uh, nimble and, and faster uh, to act on, on opportunities to actually create the sort of stuff that they as an organization then can digest. So there's a consumers association in the Netherlands. Uh, they care about the exploding healthcare costs in the Netherlands, but they have no way of actually creating something that would make the actual cost of healthcare transparent to them. It's one of the most intransparent sectors in the Netherlands, even though we spend a third of our own money on it. Um, uh, so they work with small organizations that are actually able to quickly build something that allowed people to easily enter the, you know, the, 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 uh, the bills and the information that they got for their own treatments from hospital and aggregate that quickly up to something that made healthcare costs transparent. Afterwards, the organization said, oh, we could have done that themselves, but they never could have. So they are now purposely collecting these teams that can deliver something to the bigger stable hall uh, uh, 
to be more responsive that way. You know, it postpones the challenge for them to change themselves, you know, so it's a temporary solution, I guess, but it's a way of what I see happening. More questions, thoughts, ideas? Come on. We have a shy crowd today. <clears throat> They're also in the dark, so we can't. Yeah. See I think that something interesting that emerged in the in the your all of your keynotes was that uh, it tends to be about finding a way to tell the story. It's about, it's about storytelling, finding new ways to aggregate, finding new ways to understand, to find the meaning of things and to, in a way, intermediate the process, uh, not just, you know, let everything to an algorithm in the, in the flow. Um, having heard each other, do you have any additional thoughts or any inspiration from what happened on the stage? Okay, I'm being made to go first. I think I make a distinction between narrative, story, and collections of anecdotes. Mm -hmm. right? So part of the problem you've got is if you allow what power can do is to control the narrative. Right? So if you can control all the mechanisms of communication, you can control the narrative, and we can see that being done very effectively by Trump. Right? You just pick one aspect, like what happened with yesterday's report. Yeah? basically says the investigation's fine, but there's one phrase which can be picked up and magnified, yeah? And then that becomes a do dominant narrative. It's what we call a trope, yeah? So the danger is if you, and people keep trying to change the narrative, and I hate to tell you this, but the right and criminals are more effective at that because they have less connection with stuff. So I think that's one issue, right? I think the other issue is the desire to have the right stories told. And this is an Enlightenment liberal problem. They kind of like have a belief about what stories they want to hear, and if they don't hear them, they get distressed. Part of our problem, Brexit Trump, was we were all Italy, is we're not listening. I was at the Hay Festival a couple of weeks ago, Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister, basically said the lesson of Brexit is we didn't listen to the way that we were disempowered people, and telling them they're wrong is not going to make a difference. We're not addressing their real world issues, right? So to me, the critical thing is granularity. Mm -hmm. What you need is not a single story, but you need a cluster of authentic narrative. And people can say, what could we do to get, and it's what can I do tomorrow to create more stories like this? It's not how do we get more stories like this, it's what can I do tomorrow, which is more likely to create more stories. Yeah? I think it also links in with coming back to this one as well. We, we have this belief in context-free rules, and it's a real problem. You know, so we, we try and create universals when actually people live their lives in particularities. We've had a lot of success in health and safety by allowing people to break the rules if they have 10 years of experience and somebody with five years experience signs off on it. We've actually saved lives by allowing health and safety rules to be broken. We just completed a big project in the northeast of England, which says the thing which is causing mental breakdown in firemen, policemen, and ambulance men isn't their jobs, it's the health and safety rules designed to make them safer. Yeah? Because we're not allowing for human judgment and for the build-up of experience on that. So I think we're all emphasizing narrative, but the thing which came home to me is we should stop talking about what narratives we want and we should be start talking about what actions we should do so that those narratives are more likely to emerge. I shouldn't know what to say. Um, because I think my take was more abstract and than you guys' take and that's much more practical and you deal with um, very practical problems that different contexts um, are dealing with, business and I don't know, I come from a different area. What is scary for me is how um, this public conversation is not happening. Um, 
Um, I mean, some people deny the reality of filter bubbles and their impact on judgments. But I think from one aspect at least, they are very harmful because they prevent a public conversation. Um, and I don't really need, know how we can get out of this situation without having the space for a public conversation. That is re the definition, the very definition of journalism and democracy at the same time as James Kerry said. Um, so somehow, yes, obviously the Enlightenment started modernism and that has had its own consequences and downsides and problem, has created many problems, but then I think, you know, after a few decades um, of the critique of modernism, which I'm also very sympathetic to, I'm a huge Michel Foucault fan, and uh, you can't be a modernist if, if you like Foucault, um, but then some of these problems are more basic than, I guess, than the issues that in post-structuralism and post-modernism people try to address. We are talking about illiteracy, very simple, basic illiteracy. You know, Trump is an illiterate president. And I think there are more and more of these kinds of politicians who would, you know, who would ride on the waves of anti-intellectualism around the world and they would be even proud of being illiterate, of being proud of not reading any, anything, or not reading any reports that are produced for them to, to enable them and to inform them about the options that they have. Um, so I think on the one hand, the things are very complex, but then on the other hand, they all are rooted in very simple problems. I think picking up on this though, I, mean, I remember when I was a, what, 10 years old? Right, so this is going way back now, right? And I just won the primary school mock election as Labour Party candidate, all right? And I needed to because my mother was the parliamentary candidate. And if I didn't win the school mock election, I was in deep trouble, right? And a woman called Mrs. E.M.C. Davis, who was a really scary Welsh matriarch who ran the local Labour Party, decided I obviously wanted to be a politician, so I needed to be given a lesson. So she took me out and took me for tea. Now, this is scary, all right? I'm 11 years old. She is a magistrate, a justice. Um, she runs one of the big poor areas. That's where she's a councillor for. So she puts most of them into prison, but they don't mind because they think she's fair about it. And she makes sure their families are looked after when they're in a prison. So she, they call her her magistrate. Uh, she has this brilliant symbiotic relationship with them. And she sat me down and she said, if you're going to be a politician, you need to realize one thing. The people who vote for us don't accept our ideology. Never make that mistake. They vote for us because we do things to make their lives more comfortable. And the minute we think they're making decisions ideologically, that's where things go badly wrong because popular ideology is nearly always fascist and you can't depend on that, right? And I think the big problem with the Enlightenment thinking is it worked on the back of infinitely available resources. It goes with that period of expansion. We're now period facing resource constraint where the only models we've got are feudalism. I mean, those are the only economic models we know when we get resource constraint. And we're fighting ideological battles rather than practical battles. And I think that's the bigger problem. Um. I want to briefly pick up on something that, that Dave talked about in his presentation. Uh, and that's sort of the focus of what it means to be a human being and how we then behave ourselves in the world. You know, uh, I was uh, once at a, at a conference in Copenhagen and the Danish are quite, you know, you know uh, they give a lot of space to their kids. And this was a conference where uh, uh, the people who were speaking there actually brought their kids to the conference. So the conference had its own daycare facility in the conference venue. 
And because the kids were running around, every CEO that was on stage had a completely different story from what they were saying in other places. Because it, having your son or daughter yelling from somewhere, "Daddy, Daddy, you're on the big screen," you know, that changes how you, you know, how you express yourself, you know, what, what, and how you try to bring across your ideas. It roots them in, you know, who you really are, you know, and, and and who you are to to the people that you care most about, and. But what we do when we get on stage like here, we try to abstract, and which is useful, but it also cuts out a lot of sort of the, 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 the real meaning that, that we feel in our everyday interaction. We have a question there, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, David Snowden touched uh, very quickly on some very interesting topics related to the threats that we have by digital technologies and all the tools that we are discussing in the State of the Net conference on what it means to be human. And he mentioned also concepts like the extended mind, obviously, and the impact of digital technologies and domestication and so on. Uh, so I would like if you could say something more about this and possibly as a general comment or advice to the organizer of the State of the Net conference, I think it would be very useful maybe for the next editions to inject some neuroscience and evolutionary science, human evolutionary science, into this conference to so try to attract members of other communities because I think this is becoming very important and we are learning more and more, also thanks to the neural networks, how our brain works and also the concept of mind is now expanding and involving also philosophers and others. So please, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Take a note. Um, we're actually running a parallel set of programs to the Engage in Power and Act, one that you might be interested in. So we're looking at um, three things in particular, transcendence, materiality, and history. You know? Because the concept of transcendence is really important to humans. If you look at what was coming out of evolutionary psychology, you can't avoid being religious. It, it, it's part of our evolutionary history and abstraction. And if you look at people like Richard Dawkins, their atheism, atheism manifests in religious forms. You know, it, it's, it's a fairly old, he's an Old Testament prophet in terms of the way he goes about things. So, and the mindfulness movement, which I'm very dubious about because it's trying to make a 15-year process into a two-day training course, yeah? But we seek something other than ourselves. That's part of us as a species, yeah? And so we're starting to look at how can we map the narratives of transcendence over large populations to understand what that means. We're also material creatures. I feel very differently. I mean, I'm picking up my new bike on Saturday, so. I've had to give up on Kampag and go with Shimada, so I'm really upset about that, all right? Um, but if I can go, once I've cycled more than 50 kilometers, I'm thinking very differently. So if I walk for 10 miles, all right, we know that physical action changes the chemistry of the body, the chemistry of the brain, and changes the way we perceive the world, all right? And also knowledge of history is key. I would go through every um, project I'm trying to get run at the moment, is to get people to talk about the music and history of the Weimar Republic because people have forgotten just how bad it got very quickly, right? Um, showing the film Cabaret and that terrible scene in the middle, if you remember it, where the young stormtrooper sings up and starts to sing and they turn around and say, do you really think you can control it anymore, yeah? And that lack of knowledge of history is a part of it, right? Uh, the other thing we're trying to introduce in schools at the moment is debating. So when I went to school at the age of 11, every week we stood up in front of the class. Every week, right? And you were given a card, it would say something like, you support capital punishment. And you had to speak, and I, I find capital punishment a bit abhorrent. I think people who support capital punishment are losing their humanity fast. But I had to support it for seven minutes without preparation. 
And we did that every week from the age of 11 to 18. That made us super critical. We weren't taught to be critical, but by actually setting a, a social process where your status was based on your ability to do it, we read lots of things, we researched things, we couldn't be taken account. And we're not, and children are still excited by that. I mean, my daughter is currently thinks I don't understand Deleuze, which is quite scary, all right? I prefer her back at that age saying daddy from the floor, right? Than saying I don't understand Deleuze in assemblages, all right? But fundamentally, all right, it's that ability to use childhood curiosity. Right? And my worry is if we go through two or three generations of people learning everything on information provision, then actually we're going to reduce our intelligence. I mean, take the example, my daughter won a prize for the best master's thesis, which I'm still proud of in anthropology. The essence of that, she wrote for one of her first undergraduate essays, and it, was, it got a failing mark. And I had to teach her to write to the marking plan because at undergraduate level in the UK, you have to write to marking plans. You're not allowed to write originally. Yeah, and I think yeah, it's, it's why the educational system is so key here. We're dumbing people down yeah, at all levels of intelligence in society by restricting education to information processing and by getting people to research the web and regurgitate information. We have another question here. Hi. So, um, during the last few months, the province of Quebec in Canada created a declaration for responsible AI development. And uh, I participated in this development since uh, it was a cooperative process uh, for the whole society, including governments and companies and peoples of all ages and genders. Uh, and I would like to know your opinion about the democratization of this kind of legislation. Uh, that might arguably require some level of understanding from the parts and of the topic and knowledge of the state of the art in the field uh, to be effective. I am also Canadian, but I don't know how to answer that. I'm, I haven't followed that, so I'm not the right person to. <laughs> They are Quebecois, right? I'm Welsh, so we like the Quebecois, right? They're surrounded by a large monogot culture. I think you're going to see experiments like that, but they won't scale. If they start to work, they'll be taken over. Now, this is my point I made earlier about the minute you do things explicitly, you make yourself vulnerable to threat. Yeah? We have to work at a much lower level. You've got to, stay, you've got to, you've got to change the basic tropes. Yeah? So if I look at participative budgeting, you know, big thing we're looking at at the moment, the trouble is people end up voting for things and it's therefore they start to vote against things so that their project will work. So what we're seeing with participative budgeting is effectively creating a negative trope in which other people's failures is more important than your success. Yeah? We're, we're now playing with things, can we measure underlying attitudes and then give money into communities for them to do more like this, fewer like that within those attitude clusters but not get into this very sort of structured type approach, right? So I think the danger is small successes in small countries work differently. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Final point is we're not going to be able to legislate to control AI. We, we just need to get around this, all right? That is not a pathway. Yeah, the technology is out there. It's like you can't legislate to stop people creating nuclear weapons, all right? Um, what we've got to do is increase human capacity on a distributed basis to deal with AI. Yeah, and only after we've done that can the legislation follow. All right. Um, well, it's almost one. Uh, I think that if there are no other questions from the room, there is one question over there. I, I have a short question. Uh, I look at the network from technical background and I see a triangle of three elements. It's the software, it's the hardware and data. This morning we have been discussing about democratization, democracy of information, of stories. So we have been looking at the data, we have been looking at the software of our network. But also uh, in, the, in the talk about uh, uh, network agency, we saw an element of, about hardware, democratization of things. We, 
when we discuss about news, about uh, uh, social networks versus uh, um, TV and other things, we have to consider that we don't own our devices, we don't own the technology. It is, we are to look forward and look at the next revolution, uh, democratization of tools. Uh, my background is uh, Fab Labs and makers, movement and so on. So maybe you can spend some words about next step of democratization that will be getting ownership of uh, the tools that we are using. Thanks. Thank you. Well, yeah, of course, in practice, a lot of the tools that we use on a daily basis, we don't fully own, and not in the sense of uh, having actual, uh, 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 let's say, a title of ownership, and not in the sense of being fully in control of it. Um, but, of course, there, there are, is a lot of hardware, and you know about it because you're from uh, working in Fab Labs as well, where that ownership has shifted. Um, but like I said this morning, a lot of that type of hardware is still very hard to use. So you know, even in my daily life, so I don't run anything on uh, you know, anything critical on open source hardware in my home because it's just easier to get a fridge from somewhere else and or or have uh, my stuff uh, you know be delivered from some big corporation. Um, the the uh, for a lot of tools, I think that's pretty much okay, but it, it becomes a problem when it introduces asymmetries in what I can do and what somebody else can do to me, because then you get power differences. I like Facebook for how it connects me to people that I otherwise would not be connected to, but there's a huge asymmetry about what Facebook does around me and to me, and what I can do in, you know, in, in re, maybe in resistance or in contrast to that. So then it becomes an issue. And, you know, and I don't have that type of issue with my fridge. I w would have it if I had a John Deere tractor, where they basically say, you didn't buy the tractor, you buy a license on the software that we run on your tractor. And you know, then it becomes an issue again. So as soon as somewhere in a tool this power asymmetry pops up, then it becomes problematic. And then what you call democratization, I just call it spreading it, uh, um, uh, becomes more uh, important. Uh, the thing is, most of us aren't really critical about that when that is happening. We're, you know, we are not aware of a lot of the times where those type of power differences may emerge. And that's because we, we don't really ask questions of our tools often enough. Um, this is maybe not necessarily related to this directly. Uh, one of the themes that I think, one of the meta-narratives of all this stuff that we are experiencing is very well described by Guy Debord in the 60s. Um, he says, we have moved from the idea of being in pre-capitalism, I think, to having in capitalism, and now we're moving from having to appearing in post-capitalism. So, <clears throat> so you can expand this, you can apply this to anything. You know, information, being informed, having information, appearing to be informed or having information. You know, wealth, education, faith, um, everything. Brands, for example, are basically what they are appearances. They're not havings, they're not beings, they're just appearances. So I think in every aspect of your social life and political life that we see now, you see this shift of things losing their direct relations to reality in a way. So when you when you look at this bigger picture, then it becomes really scary when, um, for instance, um, you know, especially when it comes to education, as you said, education is so important in the way societies continue to function. Um, if having education is not important anymore compared to appearing to have information, this is really scary, especially now because everybody is becoming with social media, another aspect of social media that I forgot to address is the fact that we are all becoming performers. I mean, you know, Goffman, American sociologists have talked about life as theater and um, 
that aspect of social life because we're all performing for small audiences in our family, colleagues, friends, streets and all that. But now we are encouraged constantly to perform for a wider audience that we don't even know them. And, you know, so the whole mechanism of appearing things that you don't necessarily are is becoming reinforced with these with this constant scene or theater that we are encouraged to be on, on, on Instagram, on, on Facebook. So if we are now presenting something, we are performing something to you, this is not just us anymore. This state, there's no line between this stage and you guys anymore. Um, many people are now tweeting probably or taking pictures on Instagram and putting them right now and this is a constant performance that didn't exist. And I think this is one of the major shifts, civilizational shifts, that is leading us into a very weird thing that I don't even know how to grasp. So all these discussions are happening within this third phase of appearances. And that's the scariest part. And I completely endorse the performance issue. And I think that worries a lot of us. Yeah? Um, it is one of the main issues of mental breakdown, um, particularly in young kids. And with the teenage suicide at the moment is a worldwide problem, all right, and getting worse, all right? And part of that is people don't understand their ordinary lives except in the context of believing they're in a reality show. Yeah, and I think that's deeply problematic. I think the other thing, just to come back to what you asked, I think the Internet of Things is probably a more profound transition than either the first scalable computers back in the, the 80s, right? Um, because it's pervasive right, in terms of the way it works. But the control mechanism really scares me. I mean, one of my jobs is to look at how these things can be misused. And medical nanobox could be used to kill you. Now, just remember, any, any of these things can be accessed, they can be hacked. I think one of the best ways to understand this is a science fiction writer who regrettably died. He got cancer early. And very black sense of humor. When he got fatal cancer, he asked his long-term girlfriend to do him the honor of becoming in his widow. All right, he's got that sense of humor. Um, he's called Ian M. Banks. And he created, as Ian Banks, he writes as a novelist um, and a brilliant novelist in the modern generation. As Ian M. Banks, he writes as a science fiction writer. And he creates a thing called The Culture. So it's, it's a future world in which, for the culture, money doesn't matter because technology and AI means anybody can do whatever they want. Right? Now, that we're getting pretty close to. I think what the Internet of Things is going to do is we could, if we choose, remove the artificial rationing of money on resources. You know, one of the projects I'm trying to get funding for the moment is to look at how so-called primitive societies use gifting to exclude or include people in communities because it's not an exchange. Yeah? So he posits that sort of future. And it's both positive and negative. The really scary thing is, I put up the, the cover from it on a slide, a book he wrote called Surface Detail, in which humans actually use AI to create virtual hells in which dissenters are condemned. Uh, and it's hell in the full medieval sense of the world. And it's the actual distributed computing capability that allows that to happen. Yeah? So I think at the moment, everybody is taking this, the enlightenment tradition has continued on in IT firms. Everything is about how this stuff will be wonderful. Nobody's really exploring how it might not be wonderful and how we prepare people for that. Right? And I think that, some of it, is what I say. Things like gifting, things like clans and families become really important because within a clan or a family, you, get, you can inhibit the impact of individual social media change. Yeah, and that's, you know, so if people start to receive signals within a human validation network, it's very different than if they receive signals as individuals. Yeah? And I think that's the sort of level we've got to start working at. Okay, lunch is ready. Uh, let's all get back here at two sharp. Uh, we're going to have Roy Perticucci from Amazon and then Gigi and Dave and Anna and it's going to be great. So see you soon. <laughs>